Welcome, my dear students and YouTube viewers, to this continuing coverage of Chapter 4, Chemical Reactions in Aqueous Solutions. For this, I will teach you neutralization, also called acid-base reactions. So, as a general definition, and there are more technical definitions that we will cover in later chapters, strong acids are acids that are very water-soluble and dissociate to form H+, which we sometimes just call proton. For example, HCl is a very strong acid. When you throw that in water, it can dissociate to give off H plus and Cl minus. So it gives off H plus, ergo it's an acid by our simple definition. Now we will talk about acids in greater detail in later chapters. As I discussed in an earlier video, there are seven strong acids, these seven, that I specifically require you, my university students, to memorize their names, their formulas. Okay. Now, also for my university students, we will assume that all acids that are not on this list are weak acids. Although that's not 100% true, we'll just make that assumption. What about strong bases? Well, as a general definition, and again, there are more technical definitions that we will cover in later chapters. Strong bases are bases that dissociate in water to form OH-, which is called hydroxide. For example, sodium hydroxide is a strong base. You throw that in water, it separates out to form sodium cation and hydroxide anion. It gives off OH-, ergo it is a strong base according to this definition. Now we will discuss strong bases and bases in general in greater detail also in later chapters. Okay, so I require my university students to please memorize the following strong bases. Group one metal hydroxides like lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium, rubidium, and cesium hydroxide, as well as the following specific group two metal hydroxides, which are calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxide. And that's it. Now, Reactions between acids and bases are called neutralization reactions. They're also called acid-base reactions. Same thing. They always form H2O and a salt. And when I say salt, I mean an ionic product, a product that has metal or metals bonded to non-metal or non-metals. Make sense? For example, here's a strong acid, nitric acid, reacting with sodium hydroxide. What happens? Well, we end up doing a partner swap, so we get H2O as a product, and the sodium goes together with the nitrate to form sodium nitrate, an ionic product product or salt. So this is what happens when strong acids and strong bases get together. We always get H2O and salt. Now you might notice, by the way, that neutralization reactions like this, also called acid-base reactions, are a specific type of metathesis or exchange reaction. As we've discussed heavily in earlier videos in this chapter, an exchange reaction is one in which there's a partner swap. One cation swaps partners with the anion from the other compound and vice versa. So how does this apply up here? Well, yeah, if you look closely, you'll see that the sodium over here, which is the cation in the compound on the right, is getting together with the nitrate, which is the anion in the compound in the left, to form sodium nitrate. You see that? Similarly, H, which is the cation, okay, it's not technically a cation because this is not an ionic compound, but you can kind of think of it that way, sort of, is getting together with the anion hydroxide on the right, like that, to form H2O. Now, I realize as you look at this, you might think, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Shouldn't this be written as HOH? Yeah, I mean, if it's easier to see it that way, you actually can. You could rewrite that as HOH. So this is very similar, a partner swap reaction, kind of like a metathesis reaction. H2O, by the way, is of course the same thing as HOH. HOH is H2O, but that's what we're doing, partner swap reaction. Can you see that pattern? So again, acid-base reactions, also called neutralization reactions, always form water and an ionic salt. Now, as a tangent, here's a link to an entertaining acid-base explosion video. I'll post a link in the description below so I don't violate copyright. You don't have to watch it, but I recommend you do because it's kind of hilarious. But please note, do not try this at home. It is extremely dangerous and stupid, but very entertaining to watch. And I like entertaining. <laughs> All right, then. So how do you write out a balanced neutralization acid-base equation? Well, we follow the same steps that we did for our net ionic equations that I discussed in an earlier video linked to in the description below. Basically, we begin by using steps from a previous video to write out a full and balanced precipitation reaction, which involves doing a partner swap, then identifying what things are soluble or insoluble, AQ or S, in our reaction, balancing the equation, and then if everything is AQ, we write no reaction. Now, the full and balanced equation, or precipitation equation, of course, is called a molecular equation. Then we go on to cut all the AQ species in half, separate out the ions where coefficients are left alone, and subscripts become coefficients. The result of that step is called a complete ionic equation, and then we end by algebraically canceling out anything that's the same on both sides of the reaction. Those things that get canceled out are called spectator ions. The resulting equation is called our net ionic equation. Now again, this is the principle for writing out a net ionic equation, and the principles are similar for neutralization reactions. I just wanted to remind you of this. I, I discussed this in an earlier video. But we'll go ahead and apply it to specifically now to neutralization equations. 
So in a neutralization reaction, we're going to use the steps from our earlier video to write out the neutralization reaction's molecular equation. Again, to do this, please remember that neutralization reactions generally look kind of like this. There's H stuck to something, and the A just represents the rest of your acid molecules formula. And then we have R stuck to an OH. R represents the rest of your bases formula. They do a partner swap. Remember our partner swaps? We have our H go together with our OH, and our R go together with our A, so we end up getting HOH, which is water, and R stuck to A. Now we do eventually have to add subscripts that I'll represent as W and Z here, but the exact identities of these numbers, W and Z, you might have to toy with in order to make it so that the sum of A and R's charges equals zero. In other words, we have to toy with W and Z numerically sometimes in order to make the charge on R and the charge on A cancel each other out, all right? So that is step one. Step two is if your problem requires it, it depends on what you're given on your homework problem or your exam problem or whatever. You need to follow the steps discussed in a previous lecture to convert your molecular equation into a complete molecular equation. And then if your problem requires it, again, if your problem on an exam or problem set asks you to do so, you then follow the additional steps discussed in our previous lecture, again, linked to in the description below, to convert your complete molecular equation into a net ionic equation. And this again can be done for acid base slash neutralization reactions. So let's take a look at some actual examples for my university students homework. I want you to complete and balance the following neutralization equations and then write out net ionic equations for each. Now, I'm not going to do all of them here, but I will begin by showing you the first one on the board. The process for writing out a net ionic equation for a neutralization or acid base reaction is identical or analogous to what we saw with the net ionic equation concepts that I outlined in earlier videos that are linked to in the description below. First, we do our partner swap. So here I have H, which is the thing on the left and the substance on the left. And on the right, I've got an OH on the right. So I'm going to have the H here get together with the OH there. Then I've got a calcium on the left in the compound on the right that's going to get together with the bromine that's on the right in the compound on the left. That's hard to say without messing that up. Anyway, I'm going to do the partner swap. Now, when I do the partner swap, I do not bring, initially at least, subscripts along for the right. I leave the subscripts behind at first, OK? So the H is going to get together with the OH. And I like to write that as HOH. -H. It's really the same thing as H2O. It's water, because all uh, strong acid, strong base reactions form water and an ionic salt, OK? Then I'm going to have the calcium go together with the bromide, OK? So calcium bromide, C-A-B-R. So that's the initial partner swap. Now, we aren't quite done with the partner swap step. The next thing that we need to do with the partner swap is we need to figure out what the charges are of all the cations and anions on the left and bring those charges over so that we can then subsequently lay down subscripts where needed. And this is why I say initially you abandon the subscripts when you bring things over. Then you figure out and parse out the charges and then lay down subscripts where you need to, OK? Now, brom HBr, strictly speaking, is not an ionic compound. An ionic compound, you remember, is something that has metals bonded to nonmetals. These are both nonmetals. So Strictly speaking, the Br does not have a true full charge, and the H doesn't have a true full charge either, because that's reserved for ionic compounds. They have partial charges. Nevertheless, for the sake of bookkeeping, we can kind of pretend that they do. Based on bromine's location on the periodic table in column 7, it wants to have a minus 1 charge so that it can gain one electron in order to scoot one box to the right to feel like the noble gas column 8. Therefore, bromine here will have a negative 1 charge. H, by contrast, is going to have a plus one charge. And we can write that down in order to cancel out the minus one charge on the bromine or neutralize it. Okay? Those charges come along with them when I move to the right. So I'm going to have a plus one charge over the hydrogen here. And I'm going to have a minus one charge for the bromine there. Good? Now, what about the calcium? Well, calcium is in column two of the periodic table. Because it's not in the D block of the periodic table, it does not happen to be one of those metals whose charges are confusing. It's column two, which means its charge is always going to be plus two. So I can just take note of that, plus two for the calcium, OK? I'll bring that along over here, plus two. It should fall. And again, another way to derive that is the fact that there's a two subscript down here next to the hydroxide. You can just bring that two up here and place a plus next to it. That's the charge for the calcium. Now, there's a one implied, not written, but implied. Whenever you don't see a subscript, it's the same thing as writing a one, OK? So there's an implied one next to the calcium. I can bring that up here and put a negative next to it. And that is the charge for each individual hydroxide. Hydroxide is a polyatomic anion whose name and charge and formula I require you to memorize. I'll link to the video where I initially described that 
in the description below, okay? Nevertheless, that negative one is gonna come over here and the hydroxide as a whole then has a negative one charge, okay? You can kind of drive that there. Now that we've done all that, we're gonna bring these uh, numbers down here and use them to lay down subscripts wherever needed. So I could take this one and bring it down as a subscript for the H, bring the one down, and I could just write a one there, but remember, ones and subscripts we don't write down, they're just implied, okay? I can do the same thing over here, the one here for the hydroxide, I bring it down, and it's just a one. So HOH goes together with no subscripts, just like that. And again, you can write it as H2O, totally fine. I'm gonna leave it as HOH though, so that we can see the partner swapping pattern, all right? Over here, I'll do the same thing. I bring the one down here as a subscript for the calcium, which means that I don't really write a subscript. And then I take the two down here and bring it as a subscript for the bromine, okay? So I have Br2. Now, if you look at everything, uh, this should make sense that it requires two Br minuses, that is two bromides, in order to cancel out the plus two calcium. See, each Br has a minus one charge. Calcium has a plus two charge. How many Br minuses do you have to have in order to neutralize or cancel out the plus two? If each Br minus has a minus one charge, you have to have two Br minuses. There are two bromides, Br minus one, for every one calcium or to cancel out that charge. And that's the way we can do these cross subscript things or this technique, okay? In order to make things easier to see for the next step, I'm gonna clear off the charges in these arrows right now, okay? The next step is use our solubility table to determine what things are soluble and what things are insoluble in water. Now, we don't have to do that for substances on the left because it already is given to us. It tells us that they're AQ, which means that they're aqueous, which means they are soluble. We just have to do it for substances on the right. What do you do with HOH or H2O? Well, yeah, you should know that unless we're dealing with a high temperature reaction or something like that, this is a liquid. H2O is a liquid, so you don't have to use the solubility table for H2O at all. It's just liquid, write it down, at least in aqueous uh, reactions. It's just a liquid. What about calcium bromide? For that, we will have to go to the solubility table. So looking at the solubility table, you can see that calcium doesn't really appear anywhere, but bromide does. It appears in the top half of the table, which is the solubles half. So that indicates that bromides are always soluble in water except for silver bromide, mercury bromide, or lead bromide. Is calcium one of those three exceptions? Silver, mercury, or lead? It is not, which means that calcium is not an exception. Hence, calcium bromide is soluble. And for soluble substances, we write AQ, okay? We're not done with that step. The next step is to add coefficients in order to balance the chemical equation. Using principles that I discussed in an earlier video linked to in the description below, we're going to go ahead and add coefficients. Now remember, once you've laid down the subscripts, they're done, they're written in stone, you do not change subscripts in order to balance things. You lay down coefficients only, which are the bigger numbers to the left of each chemical formula, okay? So looking left to right, I've got one H on the left side of the equation, and I have one H on the right, we're good. And I'm gonna treat the OH, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna treat the OH as its own thing, okay? So I'm not, I'm not analyzing these two H's separate, I'm just counting this H and this H. They balance each other. The BR on the left, I've just got one, and on the right I have, oh, I have two BRs, so what do I do? I'm gonna add a two coefficient. So now my BRs are bounced, but I've screwed up my H's. <laughs> so what am I gonna be able to, or have to do now? Well, I'm gonna have to add a coefficient over here. So now let's start over. I've got two H's on the left, two H's on the right. I have two BRs on the left, I have two BRs on the right. Now I can go over to calcium. I've got one calcium on the left, and I have one calcium on the right, and I have two OH's. See, there's parentheses wrapped around that OH, and there's a two there, so there are two OH's on the left. How many OH's do I have on the right? Yeah, this two coefficient multiplies all the way through, so there are two OH's on the right. Everything is bounced, so we're done with that step. And the next step in this process is to take every substance that is an AQ and cut it in half. So here I've got AQ next to HBr. I'm gonna cut that in half, separating out cation from anion. Again, for molecular compounds, compounds that have all non-metals like HBr, technically there's not a cation and anion per se when they're together, but when they do get cut in half, they do separate out into ions, all right? Over here I've got AQ, so I'm gonna cut that in half. Liquid does not get cut in half, but AQ over here, that gets cut in half, okay? Now there are two things that you have to remember when you cut things in half. When things get cut in half, the two uh, ions, the cation and ion, separate, and the subscripts, wherever applicable, become coefficients, and the charges get unveiled. So here I've got two H's, there's no subscript, it's a one, but you know, we don't have to worry about it. So when that gets cut in half, the H's charge, which is plus one, gets unveiled. And if you don't believe me, you can go back in the video, because I erased their charges here, and you can see what the charge is that I had written over the H. So I've got HAQ, or H plus AQ, two of them. Okay, now I'm gonna figure out the BR. Now this two multiplies through, which means that I also end up with two BRs, and the charge on the BR is minus one, okay? And I'm gonna write AQ next to that. 
Okay, so that's what we've done. What that really means is that when you throw HBr in water, it dissolves out and separates into H plus and Br minus. Specifically, if I throw two HBrs into water, I get two H pluses and two Br minuses. And that's what we're indicating when we cut this in half, all right? Now I'll do the same thing with calcium hydroxide. Calcium here has no subscript, so I don't have to worry about that. I just write it out and unveil its charge, which you'll remember if you go back earlier in the video is a plus two, and I write AQ next to that. What about the OH? Well, the OH does have a subscript. That subscript two has to be brought out in front of the OH to turn into a coefficient, okay? And I write down the charge for the OH, which is minus one. It is also going to be AQ. So now I've done all of my cutting in half for the left side of the equation because I don't have enough room on the board. I'm not going to continue with the right side of the equation going to the right here. I'm going to have to bring it down and write a second line. Nevertheless, hopefully you're okay at least imagining that what I'm writing in the second line is actually the right side of the equation. H2O or HOH is just a liquid, so I'm not going to cut it in half. And for the sake of being nice, I'm going to just rewrite it as H2O. Hopefully you're okay with that, and I'll write a liquid there. Then we'll go over here. This does get cut in half, so I'm going to unveil the charge. There's no subscript next to the calcium, so I leave it as is, but I do unveil its charge. It's plus two, okay? And I'll write AQ next to that, all right? What about the BR? Does it have any subscripts? It does. It's got this two. So the two comes out front of the BR, and the charge on the BR gets unveiled as minus one. The AQ is written down underneath it. So that is my full or complete ionic equation. Now, in order to get a net ionic equation, I have to cancel out anything that's the same on both sides. On the left side of the equation, which is really the top half of the equation, I've got an H plus here. On the right side of the equation, that is everything to the right of this yield sign, that's really the second line of the equation. Do I have any floating free H pluses that look just like this? The answer is no, so that does not cancel out. What about the BR minuses? Yeah, I've got a Br minus here, and I have a Br minus down here. So I will cancel those out, just like algebra. What about the calcium two pluses? Yeah, I've got a calcium two plus here, and I have a calcium two plus down here, so they cancel each other out. What is left is the net ionic equation, which in this case is this equation right here. Now, if you want, you can algebraically simplify this even further because they all have the exact same coefficient of two next to them. So you can divide the whole thing by two, so you just end up with a one next to every single one. I'm okay with either form, to be honest, but that would be the net ionic equation for this entire process. When you react strong acid HBr with strong hydroxide base calcium hydroxide, this is what happens. What ends up uh, occurring in addition to that is this calcium ion and the bromide ions just fro float freely around in solution and don't end up participating in the reaction. In other words, these things we cancel out are called spectator ions because they don't actually participate in the reaction. Now, one thing I need to emphasize is do not naively think that every time you react a strong acid with a strong hydroxide base that the net ionic equation always comes to just H plus plus hydroxide equals H2O. That's not the case. That's not always the case, at least. Often it is, but it's not always. In order to figure out the correct answer every single time, you need to go to the, through the process correctly that I just outlined.